Hey everyone, you are watching The Business of Law, the only web TV show focusing on the challenges and opportunities facing the legal profession. I'm Lee Pacquiao. So I was on vacation last week and a friend pointed out a really interesting book by Josh Young on the life and times of American lawyer Fred Levin. It's a fascinating read. Fred is one of the most successful lawyers in the country. He's also one of the most controversial. He played a pivotal role in the litigation against big tobacco in the 80s. He changed the face of plaintiff's law as we know it, and he donated millions of dollars uh, to the University of Florida Law School. Uh, just an amazing life. Uh, we're thrilled to have Fred join us from Florida now via Skype. Fred, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for asking. So we're going to get to the law stuff in a moment, but uh, before we do, I, I have to ask this. Um, you have this intimate uh, relationship uh, with uh, the boxing uh, uh, space. How did you get involved in, in professional boxing? <laughs> I've been real, real fortunate throughout life, including in the law practice and family and everything. And um, after the 1988 Olympics, which was in Korea, a resident of Pensacola, Roy Jones Jr., was uh, actually he was screwed out of the gold medal. He was fighting a Korean. So he came back to Pensacola, and it was uh, uh, throughout the nation of the United States. People were really upset about, I mean, Roy beat the heck out of him and, and didn't get the gold medal. So uh, once he and his father returned, to Pensacola, his father came in to see me and said, would you like to represent my son? And I explained to him, I didn't know very much about the business of boxing. And uh, he said, that's the reason he came to see me. And that started in September of 1988. And it went on till Roy went up through everything till he became the heavyweight champion. He also uh, was selected as the uh, top pound-for-pound pound boxer of the 20th century, and that's over Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson, and all of that. So that's how I got involved in it, and uh, it was exciting and it was fun. Uh, it's an interesting detour in the career. Uh, and also, I have to point out before we get to the nitty-gritty here, uh, you're a chief uh, in the African nation of Ghana, uh, so, so you have that going for you, which, which of course is nice. Uh, how did that happen? All right, <laughs> representing Roy and uh, it, I became sort of a, a well, I, I was elected manager of the year by the National Boxing Writers Association and was getting all kinds of publicity. It just happened that I happened to have the greatest boxer in the world. And he was, you could, uh, in the 50 fights that I worked with him, you could count on your fingers and your uh, toes the number of rounds he lost, uh, not a fight. Mm -hmm. And so uh, everything, I was getting all this great publicity, and I got a call from a person who said, would you like to represent uh, a boxer named Ike Quarte? Ike was from Ghana. And anyhow, to make a long story short, I started representing Ike, and uh, Ike was making about $50,000 a fight. He was a world champion. And... I was able to negotiate a fight for him with Oscar De La Hoya, and his fee was $5 million, his purse was. And uh, that was rather exciting to Ike and to the people around him. And unbeknownst to me, the people around him were the royal family or related to the royal family of Ghana. And the next thing I knew, they had put me up for to become a chief in the country of Ghana. I thought it was something like... Uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, a colonel in the highway patrol here, which they used to just <laughs> give out the cards. Right. Well, it wasn't quite like that. Oh, you had to do stuff. Yeah. So I went to the United Nations where I was instooled, and that's the correct word, as a chief in the country of Ghana, one of only three Americans, Shirley Temple Black, who had been a former ambassador, uh -huh. and Congresswoman Bar Barbara Jordan. So Very it was cool. quite an honor. Yeah. So I want to turn now and talk a little bit about how your business has changed over the years. Uh, when you started out, uh, plaintiff's law was basically uh, a type of thing where one lawyer represented um, a client directly uh, and followed through uh, until the end of the process. Um, that's very different from uh, how the business works today. Uh, what do you make of the, the dramatic changes you've seen uh, take place in your part of the legal profession? 
Well, I spend uh, almost 99% of my time in single event cases, which basically is the same type of case that I always handled from the time I first started. But there's been a major difference there. Uh, when I started practicing law and trying cases, I could, uh, uh, oh, I could try a case in a day or two. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, in the same exact case, you get involved with experts. We didn't have experts back then. Uh, other words, I would, in closing argument, say what I thought happened. Uh, nowadays, you have to hire an expert to say what I tell him to say. And that's basically it, and it's very, very expensive. And then on the other side, you've got, uh, oh, they'll paper you to death with motions, and uh, it just, it's gotten to a point where uh, it's, uh, it's just so expensive that and it just, it's, it's just the kind of thing that, that uh, I would certainly not recommend a young lawyer getting into. It's right. just, it's way too expensive, way too time consuming, and the defense spends more money on lawyer's fees than they could have spent in settling the case. Right. So that's the big, big difference. Time, money. Plaintiff's lawyers um, catch a lot of flack uh, from, from people uh, in, in the media and news flow. Um, you've been probably dealing with that sort of thing throughout your entire career. Um, how do you do it? Well, when I first started, um, I, and I would select a jury and I would feel like I was one of them. And what occurred, that was uh, in the 60s and the 70s. And then in the 1980s, the insurance industry, the medical profession, uh, and the major corporations started spending money uh, smartly from their standpoint, uh, demonizing the plaintiff's lawyer, the plaintiff's bar, the, the uh, victims. And it finally, uh, it took hold. And so slowly but surely, uh, now uh, when I stand up and uh, talk to a jury, I know they're thinking, I'm not gonna be fooled by this guy. And uh, it's unfortunate, but I mean, it's just a fact of life that we have to deal with as plaintiff's lawyers. Mm. Your name is, um, is, is attached to the University of Florida uh, Law School, thanks to a massive donation you gave them uh, a couple of years back. Um, I'm sure the school is very grateful for your generosity, as many law schools around the country are, are facing dire financial straits. There's been a sharp drop off in applications uh, to, yes. to law schools all around the country. Uh, many would say this is because there just aren't enough jobs in law. What do you think? What's causing this problem? Well, I think, all right, we go back to what I just was talking about. Litigation is down considerably. In other words, um, between mediations, between settlements, uh, it's just arbitrations, things like that. There's less uh, need for lawyers. I mean, when I first came out of law school, that's what you did. You litigated. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, uh, the courts are having less and less jury trials, less and less trials. So uh, there are less and less need for lawyers and certainly less and less need for lawyers to do what I do. And there has been a tremendous drop in the uh, applications at law schools and, uh, and there's, I believe, less jobs uh, open for them. Hmm. So I, I don't want to uh, put words in your mouth here, but would you tell someone who was thinking about going to law school today to not do it? That's a good question. Um, I, of course, I don't know what else. <laughs> I love what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they're going to get into litigation and they're going to make a career of it, I, I don't think it's going to be near as rewarding financially as it has been in my days. But I think it is uh, greatly rewarding in, in a situation of you, you're on the right side, you know you're doing the right thing. And it's, uh, so from that standpoint, I would explain to them, it's not going to be the big money game that it was for plaintiff's lawyers in the past. Mm -hmm. But 
that it it, uh, it is a very rewarding career. Yeah. No, I, I want to talk about that. Um, there are people out there, and I would suspect, uh, Fred, that, that you're probably one of them or m maybe agree with them, that plaintiff law lawyers serve um, a societal function in that they allow individual people um, a way to seek redress from much larger institutions, organizations, and companies. If there's going to be less work for plaintiff's lawyers out there in the future, what are the implications for society? It's major, and I mean, we're seeing it. Uh, I'm here in Florida, and, and uh, as you head west into Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, we find that what uh, not only what the corporations have done in the uh, medical profession and different defense organizations, but politically, they came to their senses back uh, with, uh, I guess, Karl Rove said, why don't we go out and buy ourselves the appellate courts? And they did. And so the a net effect of, of this is that in a situation such as uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, the further west you get, it gets to a point of where you cannot be successful. Uh, the courts take whatever verdicts you get away from you. Yeah. Now, how does that... Uh, uh, affect the people? Well, it uh, has a major effect. If I can't, if I, I, if I do get beyond the jury and get a verdict in favor of the person against the major corporation or the medical profession, then all of a sudden it's taken away. Uh, it just, it, it, it hurts and it hurts badly and, and it's um, made a big difference in the country. Yeah. I mean, so just to paraphrase here, you're essentially saying that in certain parts of the United States, um, the, the legal system is rigged. Um, that, that, that's quite a claim. How, how exactly did that happen in your view? Well, they came in. What happened is it, they, they didn't buy the trial courts. They bought the appellate courts, or they attempted to buy. I mean, and, uh, there are some changes hopefully taking place in, in, in the states that I mentioned, but what they did, they went in and they just, uh, uh, they spent an awful lot of money uh, in elections for appellate judges. And like most elections, people don't uh, know who the judges are. And certainly they don't know who the appellate judges are. And so if every time you turned on the television, it said, vote for Judge Smith or vote for Bill Smith, he's, uh, uh, and down here, he is a strong Republican or He's for justice, or he wants to keep the criminals in jail, and that's all they hear. You've bought yourself a judge because the other guy who's, uh, doesn't have that kind of money. Mm. So that's what happened. They ended up uh, buying uh, or getting a, a judges elected on the appeal on the appellate level. And uh, in some states, I've heard that Texas that something like over 95% of the plaintiff's verdicts are overturned in the Texas appellate system. Yeah. Um, Fred, you're depressing the hell out of me. Uh, for, <laughs> for those of us that uh, don't want to continue to live in, uh, in a rigged system, um, what needs to be done? Is there any way to reverse this trend in your view? I think we're st uh, starting to see a little bit more. I noticed, I believe in Alabama, it's starting to come around. Uh, the, the only way is to, uh, uh, well, you've got to elect the right kind of appellate judges. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen outside of this area. In other words, when you see it getting ready to happen uh, in New York or you get ready to see it happen in, uh, on the West Coast or things, uh, they need the plaintiff's bar and the unions and the uh, consumer groups have got to get together and realize this is this is more serious than lobbying in the legislature. So that's the way to stop it. As to whether it can overturn what has already been done, uh, I guess you get enough bad decisions sooner or later uh, the public will react. Mm, one would hope. Uh, Fred, thank you for for speaking with us today. Well, thank you for interviewing me. I appreciated it. That's what we have for this week. If you'd like to see more, go check us out at mimesiswebtv.com. There's a Twitter handle and a YouTube channel under the same banner. I'm Lee Pacquia. See you next week.